Hi guys, thanks for joining me. Um, today we're doing an anime I watched video. This video has been really hard for me to record. I've, I've done this multiple times now, but um, I just wanted to talk about these two series that I just watched. Uh, they're really interesting series. Um, I, in my previous video, had watched Nia Under 7, and the common thread between that and these series that I just watched is an illustrator and animator named Yoshitoshi Abe. Now, um, this first series that I rewatched, I should say, is uh, Haibane Renmei. Um, this is, as far as I know, based on a doujin or self-published comic that Yoshitoshi Abe wrote and, and drew, I assume, himself. Um, he rotated the story for this and they animated it. Um, and the other series, which uh, was chronologically previous to this, but I watched it um, after Haibane Renmei, uh, is Lane. Now, and I had, I had watched this back uh, when it first came out, around 1998. Um, come to find out, I had watched Haibane Renmei as well. I thought maybe I'd only seen the first DVD, but I actually watched the whole thing. Um, if you guys remember, I said that I, I found it kind of boring, and I wasn't super into it when I originally saw it. Um, thankfully this time around I would say I have a more positive experience and uh, impression of this. The story, as it were, is about uh, this character, whose name I don't remember, it's sort of inconsequential. <laughs> she, um, she's born, she just kind of appears fully formed here as seemingly a teenager uh, out of a cocoon. So this is a fantasy world that we're dealing with. And you can see that she has wings growing out of her back, and she has a halo. So there's some very, you know, I think, heavy-handed symbolism in this. Uh, it's a very metaphorical, kind of allegorical sort of a story. So, um, you know, you, you need to, I think, be paying attention. But I felt, at least this time watching it, um, that I was able a little bit better to follow the characters and the story and sort of what they were feeling and what I think these, you know, the symbolism of this means and sort of what the message is and sort of just really what they were getting at in this. Uh, I feel like I understood it uh, at a, uh, a core level. Um, the name, Haibane Renmei, it's just transliterated here, but the kanji are for ash uh, and wings or feathers. So in this they are called charcoal feathers. Uh, they have these gray wings. And uh, Renmei, I had to look up, but I guess it's a union or association, it's like an organization. And I think there's an organization in this called the Renmei, but uh, at any rate. Um, so you follow this character, and you know, as the audience, we kind of get to uh, experience things from her perspective as she tries to figure out who she is and what the rules are of this, this world this universe, this new place that she's been born into. And, you know, it's, uh, it's interesting. It, it's kind of this little microcosm. So it's a walled town. Um, the Haibane are not allowed to leave the walls of the town. I don't know if the other townsfolk are. Uh, I think they established that right at the beginning. I don't know if I was paying enough attention, but, um, they, the town seems to be kind of run by uh, this, I think it's called the Renme, but it's anyway, it's an organization that uh, seems like a religious organization. And they have some of these very odd sort of strict rules, like the Haibane are not allowed to speak to them. There's a liaison who will, who will speak, they can speak, speak through them. And, uh, you know, they seem to, uh, you know, a bunch of them have sort of taken a, a vow of silence or something and like I said they're they're not they're not able to communicate and so it's it, it feels to me like perhaps there are some roots to th like this organization in maybe uh, you know Buddhist or Shinto sort of religious practices or sort of ceremonies uh, or, or even you know sort of power structures um, that as a foreigner to Japan, uh, I, I, I do not understand. Like the the some of the context may be lost on me, but I I don't think that that really took away you know too much from this. I think I was able to appreciate it for you know the the themes that I that I really could understand, 
and you know it's um, so on one level you're just kind of following the daily lives of these characters so this character is living with other Haibane uh, they're all girls I believe but there are boy there are male Haibane um, they just they're, they're not and they're not even uh, segregated by gender or anything it's it's just they I don't know why but they, <laughs> their, their group is all girls and um, you know this at its core, I would say, is a redemption story. I don't think that that's giving too much away. I also don't think it's giving too much away to say that this deals with some pretty, like, really heavy topic, to topics, I would say, but topic is kind of, like, I think there is kind of one topic to this, and it, it's, it's, uh, it's kind of a doozy. Um, but, you know, I think it does so, I, I don't want to say that it does so in, like, uh, kind of a light, cheerful way, because there's a lot of foreshadowing in this. And, you know, it it was just one of those things, like, I felt bad watching it, you know what I'm saying? And I, I don't think that really takes away from from what this is and what it does. It, um, I think it does, it tells its story very well, and that it's, um, you know, maybe I'll have some things to say about the, the storytelling in, in Serial Experiments Lane coming up here, but this, I think it's a very successful in, in its storytelling. And, um, you know, and I think it's, it's good. Uh, I just, you know, came away from it not feeling, like, as good about it as I was hoping. Maybe I think Nia Under 7 is more fun to watch, and I just, I think it was a more fun show. Um, you know, another theme in this, I think, is, uh, is karma. You know, I think, I think that's sort of at the core of, of this series. So, uh, it was very interesting. You know, if you can just kind of based on that, I think, uh, you know, uh, you guys may know whether or not this is something that you're interested in seeing. Some of you may have already seen it, uh, but it's good. Uh, I definitely I would recommend if you're interested in checking it out, you, you should watch it. It's, it's, a, it's a good show. Serial Experiments Lane. So this is one that, uh, you know, when I, when I started re-watching this, I, it just everything came back and I was like, oh man, like this is fun and interesting and good. Um, and it is, but it's not all rainbows and sunshine either. Uh, so with Lane, it's very much a cyberpunk story, and I have a huge soft spot for cyberpunk. I uh, enjoy reading William Gibson, uh, his cyberpunk stuff. I haven't read all of it, but I love stuff like Ghost in the Shell and all kinds of, you know, just 80s and 90s cyberpunk stuff. I, I, I love it. It's great. So this, I think, wears its influences on its sleeve. Um, you know, it, and, it, and it exists, it kind of exists alongside of, it's informed by, um, you know, by cyberpunk sensibilities. But uh, it's, ultimately, I mean, w when it starts off, it's really like psychological horror, or maybe a psychological thriller. I don't know the, you know, distinguishing details between those two in particular, but I, I would call this psychological horror, because it, it actually, it's interesting, it has a lot of horror elements to it. And, um, you know, I was reading about horror, I think uh, it's kind of on point, uh, from, from Stephen King, um, you know, sort of talking about, like, different kinds of horror, and one of the points that he was making was, uh, like, societal fears, where, you know, we, we do at any point in time, there, there are things that, that we're afraid of as a society, and, you know, I, even, I think even now, you know, there are uh, certainly, uh, maybe even more and more, I feel like this uh, uncertain kind of antagonistic relationship with, with technology, sort of the way that the internet is being used and things like that. And, um, you know, that's, that's a, a theme, without a doubt, very much in, in Lane. And I think as, you know, psychological horror, where you have a character who is, um, I mean, they almost question their own sanity in a lot of the... Uh, the series and 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 you you question their sanity and I think in some ways they're kind of an unreliable narrator um, there are you know uh, you know other characters and stuff where it's it's just you know you, you're you're not really sure like what is real and what isn't there are even mechanics to the to the world that are introduced that um, that put in question like whether something that one person perceived is like a real memory or not a real memory. Um, so there, there's a lot, a lot of very interesting uh, elements to it like that. But, uh, you know, with, with that said, um, you know, I would say that cyberpunk itself is a great 
setting and environment within which to ask existential questions. And I think that's another thing that, that Lane does. You know, it asks, you know, who is Lane? Who am I? Who, who are we all? And, um, you know, it, it's very much, uh, they even say at the beginning of each episode, present day, present time. And, you know, even though they say that, I wouldn't necessarily call this 1998 present day. It's more of like a, a, near, a near future. But, um, you know, this is a modern story, and I think it's, it's a story about modern uh, concerns. So you have things like, you know, kids getting on the internet and playing uh, networked games and, um, you know, and, and again, sort of like what, um, this, this was rather uh, prescient, I think, in, uh, in some of the things that it's, it's talking about 20 years ago, you know, that I think are, are still pretty relevant now in terms of like, there are, you know, these, these hacker groups that are, uh, um, you know, working on the internet and, you know, it's it's uh, it's interesting to see the things that um, that this was picking up on at that time that you know are actually are pretty pretty legitimate uh, you know issues now. But you know, take all of that aside. There's so much going on in this series, uh, and it tries to tie it back to some concrete things, such as um, you you have like Roswell and like sort of like alien conspiracy theory stuff comes up in this. And, you know, I, I wanted to, like, dig into some things about this series and see, like, is there some meat here? Because I feel like it references things. And um, so there was a researcher that they were talking about that was doing experimentation with, like, psionic powers and children and things like that, almost a callback to Akira, another, you know, cyberpunk uh, show. And... Uh, so, the, but the the researcher you know had this Western name, and I'm like, that sounds like a real name. I I should look that up and see. You know, is this an author or something like that? And come to find out, it actually very specifically was an author. Uh, from what I could tell, it sounds like it's the real name of the uh, author known as Lewis Carroll, I believe, which is the pen pen name of this 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 real uh, person uh, who wrote Alice in Wonderland. Um, and that was very interesting, too, in a couple different ways. I mean, one, there are Alice in Wonderland things, symbols, references in this. Um, Lane's best friend is named Alice. Um, she, you know, Lane in her bedroom has a rabbit stuffed animal. Um, you know, and, and you could question, like, is this even, like, is, is, does Lane fall down the rabbit hole? And is this story about Lane getting back out of the rabbit hole again. But um, I feel like this series like throws some things at the wall and you know not, not, not all of it sticks, you know. And I think that that's that's really the kind of sad thing about this. And I'm not who am I to criticize? you know I, I've always intended to do some writing on my own and write a story, write some characters, you know, just try that out. And I, and I haven't. I just, I have not had the courage to, to really try writing my own stories. But, um, you know, I, th I think I can still criticize Lane um, just on some, like, fundamental story writing things, uh, some issues. So, you know, like I said, it, it pretty much starts off as a psychological thriller. And I, I feel like the... It's closing, not to give anything away, but it's it's the conflict that it resolves at the end is an existential conflict, and that's fine for for cyberpunk. I mean, Ghost in the Shell. This is completely a cyberpunk uh, existential story. This is all about ex existentialism. Uh, Lane can be about existentialism too. There's nothing that says that it can't be, but for comparison, in Ghost in the Shell, right from the beginning. Um, existentialism is a core conflict for the main character. It's established early on, and and I think we come to understand intuitively and th and, and through you know the the character's thoughts and actions and just every every element of Ghost in the Shell that um, existentialism is the conflict uh, around which the entire story hinges. And and when we get that resolution at the end, it makes sense, you know. In Lane, however. Um, 
it really doesn't make sense because I think that they fumbled the the basic uh, establishment of their conflict and their resolution. Um, you know, additionally, like uh, you know, there are there are some characters that that are kind of would be uh, antagonists in this, and you know, Lane is ostensibly our main character, but I really feel like they didn't um, they didn't build up you know external conflicts properly. Um, not in such a way that the audience can can really you know find satisfaction in the resolution of those conflicts, and uh, you know it's it's weird, but like I f I feel like Lane is kind of the antagonist of of this series, at least in like a a portion of it, and I think a portion of it that I enjoyed the most was you know that that re that real um, kind of like psychological horror aspect of of Lane I think was done really well, and you know. Um, you know, it's, it's, uh, I have Lawnmower Man here, <laughs> um, which I think, you know, is from 1992, it's what, like six years before Lane, um, deals with a lot of really similar things, and I, th I think that, you know, this is a story by Stephen King, um, I don't know how many people would consider this to be like a, you know, masterfully crafted movie, but it is, it's a well-told story, and, um, you know, this, I think, does what, what Lane does, um, just much more successfully, you know what I'm saying? And I really would have rather seen Lane, I think, go in, in this direction a little bit. And, you know, maybe I'm just not understanding some things about this. And honestly, like, I'm, I'm not too proud to admit that, like, when I first saw the Blade Runner director's cut, you know, somebody kind of explained it to me, and, like, I wasn't just firing on all cylinders going, oh, I totally understand this. It's like somebody kind of explained it, and I'm like, oh, that's cool. You know, maybe somebody needs to explain parts of Lane to me. And certainly, you know, I think there's room for supplementary materials to fill in, you know, gaps in, in lane and things like that. But I, th I think there's a really, there's, you know, that contract between the audience and, and the, the show that I think is really violated by lane because I think that they really dropped the ball on some of the stuff. Ultimately, um, you know, this, this is great in a lot of ways. Um, you know, like I said, I love cyberpunk, and I think that this, this does a lot of super cool uh, things. It has a lot of really interesting ideas in it. It's a, a very ambitious, interesting, uh, you know, cyberpunk classic that is just hamstrung by, uh, by its, its, its storytelling, which is really too bad. But anyway, that's, um, that's it. I hope you enjoyed this. Uh, I hope you uh, will join me again for more anime and video game related videos. Take care.